Hi everyone and good afternoon. It's really great to be back here with you for Lunch and Learn with the United Synagogue. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Today we're going to delve in a little bit to the topic of Hanukkah. And we're going to look at perhaps a different aspect of Hanukkah than you might expect. We're going to talk about the hidden hope of Hanukkah, which is something I'm really fascinated in and hopefully you will find interesting too. And I want to begin perhaps by, well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at perhaps a, a specific aspect of Hanukkah, trying to think what is really the miracle of Hanukkah and what is something really positive about the Hanukkah story that we can take into our lives today. And I want to begin with perhaps a surprising question of has anyone, have you or think if you have been involved in a time capsule ever, um, you know, that idea of hiding things away that are a snapshot of society as we know it today for a later time. So I know when I was in school uh, in JFS, I believe it was in the run up to the millennium in the year 2000, there was a competition for the students to say what they think should go into a time capsule that would be hidden in the campus somewhere of the school for people maybe in the future that when they would find it, they would understand a bit about what life was for Jews in Northwest London in the year 2000. Um, and in fact, there was another really interesting case of a um, time capsule. I just want to share my screen to show you. I have some photos in Manchester in, sorry, just taking me a moment here. Hopefully you can now see my screen. Um, in Manchester in 2020, just a couple of years ago, they were renovating uh, the Jewish Museum there and there was an old synagogue in that building. And when they were renovating it, they actually discovered behind the Ark, the Aron of the Shul, they found a time capsule from when the uh, shul was, from when the shul was built. Um, about 150 years earlier. And it was really, really fascinating. They had no idea it was there and there were newspapers and documents and money, really that idea of giving a snapshot of Jewish life in order to safeguard it for the future. And a really ultra model time, modern, sorry, time capsule is if we think about the Bray ship mission a few years ago, they sent a spaceship into, into space. And obviously tried, we know unfortunately that it, it um, failed and it crash landed. But what's really fascinating is what they decided to put onto the spacecraft. And they decided to put Jewish items such as the Tanakh, uh, memoirs of a Holocaust survivor, the, uh, de the document that uh, was the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel, the Israeli flag, items like that, because they were thinking, what should we put? What would show what life is like today for people in the future or, or somewhere else? Um, with, we're putting something away to safeguard it for the future. Now, what is this all about? Why am I, why am I starting with this talk of time capsules? Well, these are perhaps modern time capsules. And I want us to think about ancient time capsules together today in our time. We're going to look at ancient time capsules and decide, uh, well, we're going to begin firstly with the link to Hanukkah, and then we're going to talk about three time capsules or ancient time capsules, uh, case studies from the Tanakh. So as you all know, my passion and my lab is teaching Tanakh, and I want to try and show this theme as it is found in Tanakh as well. And hopefully we'll come out with a really interesting lesson for us today in 2022. So, um, I'm going to uh, stop my screen share here. Um, okay, one moment. Okay, so what, how does this connect to Hanukkah? That's what we need to begin with now. What's the connection of time capsules to Hanukkah? Well, if I ask you, what is Hanukkah all about? I probably get a lot of different answers. So we know that um, we celebrate Hanukkah for eight days, and the reason it's celebrated for eight days is debated. Um, in fact, there is a book um, that lists a hundred different answers as to why we have eight days to Hanukkah. So I'm not going to give you a hundred answers, don't worry, uh, we don't quite have time for that. Um, but well, the book is Ne'er La Mea, if anyone wants to uh, delve into it, it's written by Rav Zel Zelcher. Um, so there is a Gemara 
in Masechet Shabbat 21b, which talks about what really is Chanukah about, okay? And, and it's interesting that it even asks the question, my Chanukah, what is Chanukah? Because you think, well, isn't it obvious what Chanukah is? But we see, actually, there's a debate. So the Gemara lists um, the, the some practical considerations of Chanukah. So, for example, it says that it starts on the 20... Um, sorry, I'm just going back to my screen share here. Okay, so the Gemara here, it begins, my Chanukah, what is Chanukah? And um, the Gemara says it's on the 25th of Kislev, the eight days, you can't eulogize on them, and you can't fast on them. Those are the practical things about Chanukah. But what's Chanukah really based on? So we have here in the bold here in the second line, um, I'm not sure if you can see my uh, mouse pointer, what I'm pointing at, but it says here, that when the Greeks entered into the temple, we know that the Greek, the whole Hanukkah story is about the Greek empire that wanted to turn us into Greeks. They didn't mind about us um, being um they didn't want us to practice Judaism. They didn't want us to be religiously Jewish. They wanted us to be like the Greeks. They wanted us to totally assimilate. And when they went into the temple, they defiled it. They brought in idols and they brought in um, pigs. They they really made it. Um, they didn't destroy it, but they defiled it. And what did they do? And they, they defiled all of the oil, all of the jugs of oil that were in the temple for the menorah. And when the Hasmoneans, when the, uh, the, the Maccabees, the Jewish army, when they overcame the Greeks, Vinitzchum, and they they uh, were victorious, what did they do? They straight away, they went to the temple, they cleaned it out, they took out the idols, they they purified it, and they wanted to light the menorah. And they only found one jug of oil that still had the seal of the Kohen Gadol. That was all they had, and we know the story. They lit the menorah with the oil for only one day, but it was a miracle, and it lasted for eight days days and that was how long it took until they could find more oil um so but we know there is a question um of what is the why do we have the Hanukkah for eight days because the miracle was for seven days right the first day that the menorah was lit was not a miracle they had enough oil for the first day. It was the subsequent seven days that were a miracle. So then why don't we have Hanukkah only for seven days? So this is a very famous question with a lot of answers. The most famous one being that the other day we are celebrating the miracle of the of the military victory because the Jewish army was so small and weak and outnumbered. Yet we won over the mighty Greek army. That was a miracle. I want to share with you a slightly different answer, which is not so well known. Here we see that Rashi, the great medieval commentator, says here about this um, Gemara that I just shared with you on the word v'chotamo. The fact that this pach of shemen, this little jug of oil, still had the seal of the Kohen Gadol. What does Rashi say? It means that it was hidden away and sealed with his ring and thus recognizably untouched. What does it mean that it was hidden? I want to focus on that first word there of the Rashi. It was hidden away. Okay. Now, the Me'iri, Rav Menachem HaMe'iri, explains in his commentary on the Gemara that the true miracle of oil was the fact that they found this sealed jug of oil in the first place, let alone how long it asked for. And he writes, if you look where I've underlined, we're just going to read this bit. Um, sorry, I should have pointed out that there is a source sheet for anyone who wants to download and follow um, a source sheet that is available, which the link should hopefully be accessible on whatever uh, media you're watching this. And all of these sources are, are available on that source sheet, on that PDF. And we see here in source number two, the Me'iri says, V'layla harishon the first night of Hanukkah, that wasn't a uh, a miracle of the oil being lit. So why are we lighting on the first night of Hanukkah? Okay, we're, we're lighting, we're, we're being grateful for the fact that that pach of Shemen, that that jug of oil was found in the first place, because the fact that that was found should not be taken for granted. And I want to... Uh, 
try and just go over this a bit more for a moment. Okay, what do I mean? Or what does the Ma'eri mean? Okay, no, I'm basing this on the Ma'eri. Okay, imagine, we, we sometimes forget how terrible it was with the Greeks there. Okay, there was um, religious persecution, there was struggles, there was fear, there was terror. The Greeks, soldiers were coming, they were violent, there was people, you know, houses being looted, people being attacked. In all of that craziness, in all of that fear, most people were running for, you know, for safety, to hide, to protect their loved ones. But it appears that there was one Cohen, one priest with access to the temple, with access to the Beit HaMikdash, who in the midst of all of this craziness said, hold on, I need to make sure that we hide a jug of oil because I know the Greeks are going to come in and I know they're going to try and destroy all the oil. And I know that in the future, we're going to beat them because I know that the Jewish people will always end up on top and we're going to beat them, but we're going to want to light the menorah and it's going to take time to get pure oil. So I need to quickly hide. My last act is going to be to hide a jug of oil for safety so that the Greeks can't defile it so that when the Jews win and overcome and drive out the Greeks, we'll have some oil to light the menorah for. It's amazing that someone had the foresight to not think of themselves and running for safety, but to think of the other, to think of everyone else, to think of the future of the Jewish people, and also to have hope, even in a dark time, that things are going to get better. It's this that I want to focus on you. That's what I mean, the hidden hope of Hanukkah, okay? He had hope for a better time in the future, so he hid something that was needed for the future so that it would be saved for the benefit of the people. And I want to share perhaps a more modern uh, ramification or aspect of this. In the Warsaw Ghetto, there was a man called Emmanuel Ringelblum. He was a historian and a teacher before the war. And in Warsaw, in the ghetto during World War II, he looked around him and he knew that this was totally unprecedented what they were going through. And he knew that in the future, people would wanna understand what life was really like because he understood that history isn't just facts and dates and the names of leaders, but history is regular people, ordinary people, what's going on for them in their lives. And um, so what he did was he gathered a few trusted friends and they decided to document life in the Warsaw Ghetto. And it's just amazing that even going through such difficult times where daily survival was a constant struggle, they spent time writing and documenting and interviewing and collecting sources together. And more than that, in the last days of the Warsaw Ghetto, when it was being liquidated and they understood that death was coming, they hid them. And um, it's quite amazing. Again, I'll, I'll just share my screen quickly to show you... Um, <clears throat> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> they uh, here we can see the canisters and the milk, uh, the metal boxes and the milk canisters in which they hid their documents. It was called the Oneg Shabbat archive. And you can see this, a lot of it um, did survive. They didn't actually find all the canisters. Um, afterwards, three, only three members of the Oneg Shabbat archive uh, survived the war. And they went back and uh, they managed to find the majority, but there are some that are still buried somewhere under the, Warsaw, or under the buildings in Warsaw. Um, but what's amazing, again, is that hope that they had for the future, that there would be Jewish historians who would want to understand what happened in the Warsaw Ghetto. And for example, one of the documents here, you can see it's slightly damaged, but this is a, a timetable from a school in the Warsaw Ghetto where Hebrew was a language of instruction. You can see on the side here, Yom Rishon on a Sunday, they had Ivrit, they had Cheshbon, uh, Maths, Polanit, which is Polish. You know, it's, it's amazing that they were there learning. There were Jewish schools in the ghetto. They were learning even in Hebrew. And that hope they had for the future is really something very special. And just to add, um, one of the people involved in the Onyx Shabbat archive was uh, Gela Zekstein, and she was an artist before the war. And during the war, she took time to paint 
portraits of children in the ghetto. And she put that in um, these Onyx Shabbat boxes, in the archive boxes, and she wrote with them, I bequeath this artwork to the Jewish Museum of the Future. And again, I just think that's such an amazing power of hope that she had just before she did tragically die along with her husband and uh, two-year-old daughter, she had hope that Jews would get through this and that in the future they would want this artwork and they were hiding it for the safekeeping for the future. And if you go to Yad Vashem today, you will see this artwork in their special um, exhibition of Holocaust art. You will see her work there. So her, her hope came true. Her vision of a Jewish museum in the future really did come true. So uh, that's sort of the message that I wanted to share of this um, hope for the future. Even in dark times, people who take hope or, or take courage and have hope that things will get better. That's really what I think is one of the amazing miracles of the Hanukkah story. And that's what I mean when I called my share the hidden hope of Hanukkah. So we've seen some more modern examples of this. I want to share with you some Tanakh case studies. Um, I have three. Perhaps we won't go through all of them. We'll see how we're doing for time. Uh, and so the first one, takes place in the time of Yoshiahu. So I have here on the timeline here, uh, we're talking about Yoash, we're talking about one of the kings in, in Malachim Bet, in Malachim Aleph, sorry, uh, the first book, the second book of kings in Malachim Bet. We have a king who's about um, 50 odd years before the destruction of the, uh, of the first temple. Um, and he He's a good king. He comes after some evil kings and he's a good king and he tries to reform uh, the temple, take out the idolatry, really try and bring the people back to good service of Hashem. And when they're doing these renovations, they find a Sefer Torah in the uh, temple and, and it's really shocking. What's this Sefer Torah? What's going on? And interestingly, our commentators tell us that this was a Sefer Torah hidden in the time of previous wicked kings. So there's two different opinions given by different commentators. I'm not going to go into it with you, but we have a Chaz here at the top of our timeline, as you can see, who's called evil. And two generations later, Manasseh, who is also an evil king. Both, it could have been um, from either of them. In their time, they destroyed, they burnt holy books, they burnt scrolls of Torah, Sifrei Torah, and that there was one person, a Kohen probably, who was scared that they were going to destroy all the Sifrei Torah, so he hid a Sefer Torah somewhere in the grounds of the temple of the Beit HaMikdash, again having that hope that in the brighter there'll be a brighter time in the future where this Sefer Torah can be put to good use. And again, by the way, at great risk to themselves, because if you have a king who is wicked enough to burn a Sefer Torah, he's probably not going to hesitate to punish harshly someone who is standing in his way. So whoever did this, whoever had the, the foresight and the courage to um, hide the Sefer Torah really did it with brave, uh, a, a great amount of uh, courage and was very brave to do so. And um, then, so, when your uh, your Shiyahu finds the Sefer Torah, it's really a massive big deal. Now, I just want to add, if you notice, it says here where I've underlined in source number three, Sefer Ha Torah, not Sefer Torah, not any scroll, not any Torah, but the Sefer Torah. Okay, the Hey here is a Hey Hayidiya, the definite article implying that this is a really special Sefer Torah. And what do here we have our commentators, the Malbim here in source number five says that this wasn't just any old Sefer Torah, this was the Sefer Torah written by Moshe Rabbeinu himself. This was a very, very important Sefer Torah, okay? So this really was someone really thinking of the future of the Jewish people. We can't risk losing the Sefer Torah that Moshe Rabbeinu Moshe wrote, so I'm going to hide it away from this evil king, hoping that in the future there'll be a good king who will put it to good use. And certainly Yoshiahu does put it to good use, and in fact, this leads us on to our set next story. So that's case study number one, someone hiding a Sefer Torah during bad times, during an evil king. We then have, okay, to continue the story because this leads into our next case study. Um, what does Yoshiahu do after he finds the Sefer Torah? It's open to the tochacha, to the rebuke, to the list of all the punishments that are going to happen to the Jewish people if they don't 
if they sin. He's scared. So he says to his advisors, go find out what God wants from me. Go seek out a Navi. Go speak to a prophet. And um, they go to Hulda. Now, I have to tell you, um, Hulda is a really fascinating character. Okay? There is a prophetess called Hulda. She's one of the seven prophetesses listed by the Gemara. And by the way, just as a side point, uh, those of you who know, uh, I recently moved to Israel. And if you don't know, I'm telling you, I recently moved to Israel. And it's wonderful to be uh, teaching for the United Synagogue from, uh, from Israel. Um, where I live, all the roads are named after Nevi'im. They're named after prophets. And it really is amazing walking around the streets. It, it's, it's like having a tour of Tanakh. So I'm in my element walking around here. There's Yechezkel Navi, there's Yemiyahu Hanavi, there's Chavakuk Hanavi. There's even Nevi'im that people tell me they didn't know it were Nevi'im until they saw a street named after them here. And one of those people is Chulda. There's a road here called Chulda Hanavia. And I like I tell you, people ask me, wait, who's Hulda? And uh, I have a share on her. She's amazing, worthy of learning about. And anyone who's um, followed me on Instagram, Pamina Savory, on Instagram, I have a uh, short video telling you about Hulda. So anyone who wants to know more about her is invited to do that. But what happens, they go to Hulda Hanivia in the time of Yoshiahu, and they say, what does this mean? Sadly, she has a negative prophecy to tell them that, yeah, there's been a lot of sinning, destruction's going to come. So what does Yoshiahu do? And this takes us on to our second case study. Okay, Yoshiahu orders them to hide the Aaron, the Ark of the Covenant, in a special hiding place. What do I mean by a special hiding place? So let's look again back to our... Uh, our um, Case study on our screen, my shared screen here. Case study two is that Shlomo built a special chamber. What do I mean, okay? So to fix on our, stay on our story, Yoshiahu orders in Divrei Hayamim in source number six, we see from the book of Chronicles two. So just as a side point, we know that Chronicles basically goes through Jewish history from creation to the destruction of the first temple. But with slight differences, um, sometimes it adds in extra information, sometimes it takes out certain information, and we always need to ask a question, hold on, what's going on? What's the difference between the stories in the two different places of Tanakh? That's really a shear for another time. But here in Divrei Hayamim, in source number six, in the book of Chronicles 2, 35, verse 3, it says that after hearing Chulda HaNaviyah's prophecy that destruction is going to come to Eretz Israel to the Jewish people, he says to them, and I'm going to read the bolded words here, Tnu et Aaron HaKodesh, take, he says to the Levim, take the, the holy ark, the ark of the covenant, but by it, Asher Bana Shlomo um, ben David, Mala, Asher Bana Shlomo ben David, Melech Israel, and put it in the house that Shlomo, the son of David, the king of Israel built. So we know that Shlomo, built the temple, the son of David, in the book of Kings, he built the temple. But it says here, put the Aaron in the bayit. Now, bayit, house, literally, normally is used to refer to the Beit HaMikdash, the house of God. But how can the bayit here be referring to the temple? Because the ark is already in the temple. What does he mean, put the ark in the temple? The ark's already in the temple. So the Ralbag, a medieval commentator, explains no, it doesn't mean the temple. The bayit here is a special chamber. What special chamber? When Shlomo, when Solomon built the temple, he knew that it was going to be destroyed in the future. So when he created it, when he built it, he created a small chamber hidden somewhere in some underground vault under the temple in order that the holy items could be hidden there in the future when that destruction came. Isn't it incredible that Shlomo had that foresight when he was building at the high point? They say he was the golden age of the Jewish people, really the high point of our history. Even at that time when he was building the temple, his crown in glory, he said, I know that something bad's going to happen in the future. So I'm going to create as part of the temple a chamber in which things can be hidden for future better time. And here we see Yoshiahu is putting it to that use. And we know that the, the ark was never found again. The Rambam also mentions this concept in the Beta Bechira in source number eight. And we know that this ark has never been found. It's still hidden somewhere on the Temple Mount. And we know even Indiana Jones in Raiders of the Lost, 
raiders of the lost ark go searching for it, doesn't he, at length. It's never found. There's all sorts of uh, rumors and myths about it. There's even a Mishnah in Shekalim here on the slide for you. I'll just summarize it. That there were two people working, uh, two kahanim, two priests working in the temple. And one of them noticed that the floor, something looked different about it. Maybe there was a tile of a different color or something was dislodged. And he saw, wait, there's an opening here under the ground. And he turned to tell his friend next to him and he died. And they understood that from there, this perhaps was a secret hiding place, but it should never be talked about because it needs to stay there for the right time in the future. So my second case study really here is this idea that something could be hidden away in the temple, that Aaron, one of the holiest items of the temple, could be hidden to the future. So we've seen a Sefer Torah being hidden in the temple. We've seen the Aaron being hidden in the temple. Now I very briefly want to tell you about my third and final case study of something else being hidden in the temple for safekeeping for the future, but not a Sefer Torah and not an Aaron, but a person. Okay, so I want to now go to the book of Malachim Bet, chapter 11 in 2 Kings. There was an evil queen, Atalia, again, also worthy of a sheer in and of herself. Well, I shouldn't say worthy, she was very wicked, but interesting to learn about. You know, everything in Tanakh is there for a reason for us to learn, to delve into it and to ask, what does it mean to me today? And... Um, I actually recently did a series called The Wicked Women of Tanakh, where we looked at the villainous female characters, and Natalia was one of them. So uh, I have a lot to say about her. But in a nutshell, she was the daughter of Achav and Yezebel, the wicked king and queen of the northern kingdom of Israel, who had the showdown with Eliyahu Hanavi. And she um, married the king of Yehuda. So she's a princess from the northern kingdom of Israel. And she marries the king of Yehuda. When he died, instead of allowing her son or her grandson to take the throne, she decides, I want to keep the throne for myself. So she actually killed her own children. She killed her own son. She killed her own grandsons in order to take the throne for herself. And I'm not making it up. You can look at it. I tell you chapter 11 in the second book of Kings. And what happens there? Her stepdaughter, Yehosheva, sees what is happening and she takes her baby nephew, Yoash, and she hides him in the temple. And there's a debate exactly where in the Beit Migdash she hides him. Never mind, we won't get into that. She hides him there together with a uh, uh, wet nurse, someone to look after him for six years. Isn't it amazing that she has the foresight to do that, to take um, I mean, she's looking after her son, she protects, she, she saves the life, sorry, not of her son, of her nephew, she saves the life of her baby nephew, which is amazing. Um, but again, at great risk to herself, because if Italia had seen what she was doing, um, she would not have been very happy. This is someone who's already killed her own family, flesh and blood. So she wouldn't stop to kill Yehosheva as well, who stands in the way. And what she does, she has bravery, she has courage, hope that in the future, Yoash will grow up and they can uh, take back the throne and get rid of uh, Queen Atalia. And that's what they do. They bide their time and then they stage a rebellion and they take Queen Atalia off the throne and, and they kill her and he becomes the rightful king again. Um, and really, that's my final case study, the idea, again, of things being hidden in the temple in a difficult, dark time to be safeguarded for the future with hope for a better future. And I think this is such a powerful message for us to think about this Hanukkah. So to summarize now and sort of bring this all together. One of the many miracles of Hanukkah, as I said at the beginning, was that they were even able to find the sealed Pach of Shem and the sealed jug that was still pure that they were able to use to light the menorah. And the idea is that someone had the foresight, had the courage, the ability to take that jug of oil and hide it somewhere special in the temple grounds so that in the future people would be able to use it to light the menorah. He had hope that things would get better in the future. And we link this to the three separate case studies in Tanakh of someone hiding a safer Torah for safekeeping, someone hiding the ark in a special chamber that Solomon had built. 
to hide it for the future. And we saw the powerful story of a baby prince heir to the throne being hidden in order that he can take his rightful place in the, at the throne uh, in the future. So what can we learn from these ancient time capsules? Um, I think a number of things. Each story had at its heart a brave and courageous individual. In fact, someone who took great risks to themselves. In most of the cases, they risked death if they were discovered in their act. Someone who, who had the foresight to, to, to think of the nation as a whole, to not think about what's best for me, but what's best, what do the Jewish people as a whole need in the future? And I think it's quite a special lesson in the power of the individual to make a difference. Often we think, what can we do? How can we make a difference? Well, these people made a massive difference. Think about it, that Cohen who hid that jug of oil, look at the difference every year we celebrate Hanukkah really because of him. If there'd been no oil, what would have happened? Okay. Um, also, I should add, by the way, that some of these people are even anonymous. We don't know their names. We don't know the name of the person who hid, let's say, for Torah from Achaz or Menashe, from the wicked kings. We don't know the name of the person who hid the jug of oil. And we don't know, um, you know, we know the name of Yehosheva. We know the name of Yoshiahu. We know the name of, of Solomon. So we know some of the names, but there are people who even did this anonymously, who never got any credit for what they did. So first of all, we see the power of brave individuals to make a difference. Secondly, we see that these people are making sacrifices for the future. They didn't see the fruits of their labor, of their efforts in their lifetime. They were safeguarding the future of the Jewish people. They were thinking about the needs of generations to come. You know, when, when Shlomo Melech built that chamber, it was put into use 400, four centuries later, 400 years later nearly. Okay? And it's still being used today because it's still hidden there today. And finally, it's really a message of hope. They all, all the case studies, all the stories we've talked about revolve around a time of darkness, a time of persecution, whether caused by our own people, whether caused by a foreign power. All the individuals had hope for a brighter future, for things to be better, that one day the item that I'm safeguarding, that I'm hiding, will be put to good use in the future when things are more positive. So just like Emanuel Ringelblum in the Warsaw Ghetto had the foresight, living through such daily struggles and such darkness and the depth of such difficulties, he had the foresight and ability to catalogue and document what he was going through and hide it in these canisters underground in the Warsaw Ghetto. And just like the anonymous hero of the Hanukkah story who had the hope to hide this jug of oil for the better times in the future. So I hope that we can take these messages on board that things will get better. I hope we're not living through such dark times today. But sometimes the winter can be difficult. The days are shorter. It's the more darkness. It's colder. Maybe not for me here in Israel. We've got beautiful weather still. But I know there's been snow for you in England. And um, sometimes it can be a bit difficult at this time of the year. We start to focus on the darkness. And that's why we're bringing back the light in Hanukkah. We're thinking of that hope that things can get better. And we can take these messages on board. I want to final, finish with one final idea that I just discovered very recently that I think ties in beautifully. It's a Kabbalistic idea that we know in the days of creation, when light was created, the light was sort of too good for the world. And after 36 hours in existence, God took that original light and he hid it. Okay, it's called the Or Haganas. He hid it away for the use of the Jets to Dikim, the righteous people of the future. Okay, so here we have an example of God Himself, of Hashem hiding something good for future use. And this light was in existence in the world for 36 hours, like I said. So if you uh, count the number of Hanukkah candles or Hanukkah lights, we light over Hanukkah, forgetting about the Shamash. If we think about day one is one light, day two is two lights, day three is three lights, and so on, comes to 36 altogether. And so there's an idea that these 36 lights of Hanukkah are corresponding to the 36 hours that Or Haganas was in existence. And therefore, through lighting the menorah, we're bringing that hidden light light back into the world, which is, I just think, something that ties in really beautifully to everything we've just said about this hidden hope on Hanukkah, this hope that things can get better. And sometimes, yes, we have to park them, we have to put things away, hide them for a better time, okay? Um, so 
Thank you everyone for joining. If you have any questions or comments or thoughts, I'm always really happy to hear from you. My email is learnwithpanina at gmail.com um, or you can find me on Facebook or on Instagram and it was lovely learning with you and I'm wishing you a very, very great Hanukkah and um, yeah, be well everyone. Thank you very much.